So that's what I'm saying. I, the text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Last and we're of back. The summer pale. It's tasty. Mm-hmm. We are back. We're talking about some pretentious movies today. This is about as pretentious as we've ever been. Probably ever will be. It's up there. It's up there. What do we have? We have a Warner Herzog film from 1976, Heart of Glass. Herzog's Glass. New to both of us. We have a Thai film, Uncle Boon Me, who can recall his past lives Please from give 2010. Us the foreign pronunciation of that one. Oh, the title? No yes. can do. <laughs> Directed <laughs> by a Pichapong We Resethical. Also known as Joe, I gather, from That's very impressive. I looked at his name and said Got it. Moving on. As in I do not get it and I never will. <laughs> it is a mouthful. And Sunset from this year. From director Laszlo Nemes. Not going to go foreign pronunciation on that one either? No. Ah, that one's a little Sorry, bit easier. I tried. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> but first, we have first impressions. What are we doing first impressions of today? Uh, we are doing first impressions on Liberté, a film from... Albert Serra. Which is premiering, I gather? Or no, not premiering. Um... Uh, it is running at the North New York Film Festival, not the Northwest Film Forum. I um, wish. And is kind of being compared passively to movies that you've loved, like Solo. Um, really? Oh, I did not know that. So I'm, I'm very excited for this movie. Liberté, I gather, is going to be a film about libertines um, and sadism. And I think that the passive synopsis was something about one person masturbating while getting pissed on and shat on. So wow. that kind of tells us what we might be in for in this period piece, uh, I think from the 17th century, called Liberté. And then we are also watching About Endlessness from... Director Roy Anderson. And I don't know anything about this. Tell me a little bit of background. I couldn't tell you much. It's just a title that keeps popping up on my radar. Nordic Cinema is a blind spot for me. Um, Roy Anderson, Aki Kurosmaki, all those guys. Like, I'm not super familiar with their work, so just... Uh, Running through the film festival and getting, res well, responses? Yeah, I believe okay. so. Uh, which one do you want to start with? How about Liberté? You know our situation. Nous avons dû fuir la cour, et depuis nous sommes bien seuls. Nos amis se font rares, et les lieux où nous sommes en sécurité le sont aussi. Je crois qu'aujourd'hui, ce ne sont plus certains débauchés qui pourront faire la révolution. Mais ce sont bien ces femmes-là, obstinées, dures, et qui connaissent le prix à payer pour que le monde puisse changer. Elles savent qu'on va venir les prendre. Elles le savent d'un savoir obscur. Elles attendent parce qu'elles ont envie, parce qu'elles sont prêtes. Il ne faut pas les décevoir. All right, that was the trailer from Albert Serra's Liberté. Is that what it's called, or is it Solo Part 2? Just as well might be. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. On board? 100%. Period piece. Uh, dialogue driven. Uh, fucked up art. I like fucked up art. This looks like fucked up art. That it does. Uh, I've only seen one other Albert Serra film. That was The Death of Louis XIV, um, which I really liked. Um, didn't know much about this one. I think my interest did just tank a bit, but... Uh, I'm still intrigued um, because, like, the, the language is graphic, but maybe it will leave more to the imagination than uh, than other films 
might. Um, I, I have no idea if it's as graphic as the language suggests it is. Are, are um, you saying you don't want to see? That is correct. That what is, was described? That is correct. Such as him penetrating the nostril? That is correct. holding its head and its willing member? I, I would assume that they can't actually shoot that. I would think so, but I, I, I don't want to doubt him just to have him prove me wrong. Yeah. I mean, if it was Jodorowsky, there's like a chance. Uh-huh. But. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm surprised. I mean, Death of Louis the Fourteenth is just a guy in a bed for like two hours. Barely anything happens. I would be sh- kind of shocked if it was just a total 180 and was just like viscerally graphic. Um, but I don't know him well enough to to know so I, i've heard it talked about as being fairly visceral in the vein of solo but not like mm. i i don't know i guess there's two different camps on solo where you either view it as a comedy or a horror and i think you might be in the horror camp i think so i think the allegory falls apart if you view it as comedy well i think it's visual comedy but like mm. its narrative is horror Mm. So it's, you know, it's in two different worlds at the same time, especially yep. how it's aged. It just, the excrement looks like chocolate pudding, as we've discussed, or chocolate cake, and so or taffy, or or Tootsie Rolls, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This looks a little bit more naturalistic. Um, but I guess enough talking about excrement and its intangible qualities of sweetness. On to about endlessness. <laughs> Jag såg en ung man som ännu inte hade mött kärleken. Vad ska man göra när man har förlorat sin tro? Det är redan september. Mm. All right. That was the trailer for Roy Anderson's About Endlessness. Indeed. Thoughts? Um, what is his name? The favorite? Sacred Deer? Oh, Lanthimos. Yes. Uh, reminds me of Lanthimos' uh, earlier films that we watched earlier this year. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we watched those like early summer. Um gosh, the uh particularly the one with the Swiss Alp is it Alps? Alps, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Particularly Alps, um, where it's kind of a you're looking at a stage play presented as cinema. Um that's kind of melancholic and and um Un- uncanny, I, I guess. Mm. Like it's it's a tone that's uncanny. How about you? Uh, yeah. So I'm not super familiar with Nordic cinema, but I do get the sense that it it tends to be like bone dry, almost kind of deadpan. And I do think uh, the early Lanthimos movies kind of strike a similar chord, um, which is something that I think would strike many people as wildly pretentious. I do kind of. Uh, think I might like this mood. Um, I think the compositions look great. Like, he just mm-hmm. has a great uh, sense for how to fill the frame. Those look quite painterly, to use that word that is also overused. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, just intrigued by his visual style. Um, that They, they, they kind of look like tableaus or something. Um, it, it looks sort of mildly funny to me, in just in, in a very, very dry way. Yeah. Um, so. Did you notice it's September already? It is. <laughs> um, no, I, I would second the, the sentiment that their tableaus are painterly. That first shot looks like um, some some classic 1940s, 1950s, mm-hmm. 60s even uh, painting modernism. Yeah, like, like a hopper painting or something. Yes, yeah, exactly, where you're just kind of looking at an industrial building that is being habitated by people going about their day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's what they do in that moment that will define the film. But it's it's kind of using that formalism that exists in other genres to tell this whatever this is. Yeah. 
but they're like so freaking pale that they look like they're dead. That's why like <laughs> the comedy seems in the, the shot itself um, just very, very dry. Uh, so I will be curious to see if this makes us laugh out loud or not. I suspect if it does, it... well, hmm. I don't know. I do have a dry sense of humor. So I was going to say, I suspect that since you sound like you're liking it a little bit more than maybe I am, but I, I do like a wicked sense of dry humor. I didn't respond well to Lanthimos's humor though. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to predict. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely interested though. When does this one come out? Do you have any idea? Uh, hard to say. It's just on the festival circuit right so now. March but March of 2020, after it's nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> seems very possible. All right. On to our more pretentious titles. And what's up first, Michael? Do you have any preference on where we start today? No, sir. No preference. Let's start with Herzog. Want to? ein Feuer fließt und der Wind bringt das Feuer daher. Ich sehe, wie die Bäume brennen wie die Zündhölzler. Herz aus Glas. All right. Warner Herzogs, 1976. Look into my eyes and look into this watch, Michael. Memorize your lines as I hypnotize you slowly. Would you like to give the folks some background on the... Uh, production tactic here employed this by Warner Herzog. Film, I don't understand the exact hypnotization process. I do know that he um, did an interview with some guy and the interview was really boring, but they figured out that they liked each other and got along in art and sports and filmmaking and the way that they saw everything and the importance of it. And he joined Herzog on this project after Herzog pitched the idea of having everyone go mad memorize and to do that having them memorize their lines then be hypnotized and then shooting the film with only one person not hypnotized um it doesn't follow a formal plot it doesn't follow any sort of a convention and it doesn't make any goddamn sense until you learn that everyone was hypnotized that's why no one seems like they're interacting in the same space and that was to kind of do a, a performative version. Um, I, I don't know if that influenced him at all, but I definitely got tones of it while I was watching it. Um, mm. It's it's a hard film to introduce. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, the short spiel is that uh, the man who kind of runs the, the town um, or is the benefactor of the village, uh, his number one artisan who makes the the ruby glass or the the red glass or whatever it's actually called, um, dies. And with him dies the secret of the ruby glass, which is the way that the village made money. And then everyone proceeds to go in fucking sane. Pretty much. So you're pretty high on it. I am. I am. And I'm just as open to it being terrible for anyone else yeah it's it's a subjective experience of positivity yeah yeah i definitely would not describe it as terrible by any means i was cooler on it i I was um i did not find it as hypnotic as i thought it might be knowing about the production strategy here um i kind of kind of came in and out of it more often than not kind of struggled to get on its wavelength um, oh, I never got on its wavelength, and I don't think I ever even got in with it. Yeah. I just, like, did you ever leave? You know what uh, I mean? Like, Kind of, yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, I do think there are some sequences that, some sequences that are pretty striking, um, and I think it's a pretty good-looking movie overall. Um, you know, we get montages where we sort of leave the narrative briefly, and we're just kind of taking in these like landscape montages 
Um, some of which I, I found very beautiful. Sometimes I just found them a little cheesy, actually. Um, uh, other times they were very poetic. Um, when did you find it cheesy? Towards the end of a couple of those, uh, the score really changes. Like, you start to get that electric guitar coming in. And it's to me, it was kind of this unwelcome anachronism. Like, it felt just out of place. Other times, the, the score felt very... Um, with the image, um, the s- just sight of the land and these people with 70s rock didn't quite jibe with me. I, I hear it. I'm not going to say you're wrong. I'm just going to say that makes me like it more. Really? Yeah. Be- because I felt like I was going insane watching the movie. Um, and... and if you're looking at something beautiful and then he can make it so that you start to like be exhausted of it and like, don't think it's what you thought it was before anymore to that degree. I feel like there's something uh, special there at bare minimum that I, I just, I respond well to when a storyteller does it. I don't, I'm not saying I liked it. I'm just Mm. saying that like, it makes me like it more. Not that I like the, like if I noticed that now, I might hate it just like you. Mm. But then I would respect the piece more because like that's his vision of making me like go in and out of these emotional fluctuations. Yeah, yeah, I I, I could see that. Um, for me aesthetically, it was just it was mildly unpleasant. I, I just I just I just didn't think that that really went together. Um, and. Story-wise, I just, I still haven't quite come up with an explanation for why the hypnotic approach for a story about madness. Um, I guess I was surprised by that approach. I was expecting for a movie about Herzogian madness to be a bit more intense in some way. And I quickly realized that is not what we were getting, right? It is much more kind of sleepy and, um, uh meandering in its rhythm totally fine i just couldn't really figure out like why that approach for this subject matter um i kind of i kind of like it on one hand that's usually the kind of movie i do like something that's pretty slow that's why i'm somewhat surprised (laughs) yeah but um it's still it's kind of that fit of form with content that i can't quite make sense of um why that style for this story it feels a little incongruous somehow i think that that reaction that your reaction to me proves that it's the right choice at some level because even removed from the film you're like kind of being driven mad by how to how to express your light what you like about it and what you strongly dislike about it and that's just like you know it's 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 exactly what he intended in some mm. way, it seems like. And I just, I have to respect the hell out of that. The way that I respect Kubrick's 2001, even though it's, it to me, pushes me away and doesn't ever really let me in. I think that I respond mm. to 2001 the way that you're responding mm. to this a little bit, where it's like, I appreciate it, but it's not for me. This is for no one, and I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose that's a, an interesting tactic it is maybe less saying something about madness less so than it is just trying to make you mad uh well i think it does both but i um not not in like a a legitimate like timeline focused way but in like a timelessness of like you know red glass like it's a great allegory or metaphor for like anything that you want to show about like a technology where once they lose how to do that, like they stumble, you know, if you want to swap that out with the Egyptians and the pyramids, or if you want to swap that out, like if we go into nuclear fallout and can't make um, processors or, um, you know, small motorized components anymore that can convey electricity, whatever, then a whole thing will fall apart and, be lit on fire and slowly everyone will go mad and lose their identity and uh, even the rulers will go insane trying to get it back and to me there's there's a deep fable like allegory that seems beautifully permanent and scriptural underneath Mm. it all 
Yeah, I mean, for me, had I not known in advance this was, like, about a town going mad, I don't know that I would have even described that as what I just watched. Um, because it doesn't even feel to me like they're like they're going mad in some no, way. No, it felt like I was going mad. I didn't know what it mm. was about until afterward. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. So you, so you did like the plot summary afterwards? Yes, just I, dove right in. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I, I think that Ebert said that it's something to be experienced, not studied, or something like that. And so mm. I was like, okay, I'll go with it, and then I'll figure out what I can figure about it. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I, I do think it is a very good looking film. I mean, not just the landscape stuff, but some of those uh, interiors where it looks like it's all lit by natural candlelight. Mm-hmm. Um, like the blacks are just pitch black. Sometimes it looks like their faces, partly because the faces are so pale. People are just like starkly you know that might white. might be true about all these movies. Herzog films? No, Herzog, um, Uncle Boon Me, and Sunset might all be naturally mm-hmm. lit. Or you know, like non not possible. using artificial lighting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think that looks great. That definitely uh, kept me going. Um, I just uh, struggled to calibrate with it. Maybe it's just that it wasn't what I was expecting. Just got to come back to it again, fresh. Um, Did you react to the seer or the prophet in any sort of overt way? Um. Not in a big way, no. Did you? He, no, but he's like, he's the one that keeps popping back in my head where like when I think about him or what he had to say, he's the craziest one. Mm. And he's the only one that wasn't hypnotized. Um, and I just, I find that really rich. And his introduction where he says, um, whatever he says about how the giant isn't real, you just saw a dwarf's shadow, you need to know where the sun is in the sky. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot to, I think that line sets up more in the movie than I've unlocked yet. I think Mm. there's something deeper about that as, and then I, I do think that the end is one of the best things that Herzog's ever shot. That helicopter shot of, uh, Mm. the, um, the rocks sticking up and the man standing there and then the three men joining him and then the musicians playing them off and them rowing. Oh, it's great. And that final line of the, uh what is it it's roughly like uh you might be encouraged by the fact that there were many seagulls following them on their trip Mm. and then nothing (laughs) yeah 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 um yeah i was never not taken with it visually i think um it's almost maybe that like it wasn't experimental enough in a way it's like knowing that it's about this descent into madness and then it in turn being kind of slow and lifeless with kind of a, an interesting approach to character. Like there are characters here mm-hmm. um, that uh, I just thought there would be a little more momentum to the narrative than there was. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I just can't figure out the, the, the rhythm of it in relation to the, to the content. Um, I, yeah. I think that's exactly what I responded to. Yeah afterward not during like during i hated the movie afterward i love it <laughs> ah, interesting you know like while i was watching it i like i said i felt like i was going insane yeah i'm yeah. ron burgundy <laughs> i think you are i think you've come you've been transformed um how did you respond to our lead um actor um who is the benefactor of this uh village um I, I don't know that I had a, a big response to him. There were... I was exhausted. Were you? By him in particular? He, the He was like capital A acting, it felt like. And I was just like so just beaten down by having to watch him. Like prance around with his handkerchief and like his pinky out practically. Like it was just... Yeah, I do really like the casting. Like there are just some fascinating people in this movie. Um, women on the verge of a nervous breakdown style like faces right yeah like iconic yeah, yeah. faces yeah 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 very very memorable uh people um like a lot and and they are so to me they so many people are so pale um uh and against some of those really black backgrounds inside um 
you know, there's something a little just dark about the tone in those scenes. Um, it's just kind of striking, I guess. Um, what else? I cannot make any sense. And I know that there's a point and Herzog loves that. I can't make any sense. And that I know that there's a point that bastard to when the father finally gets up, when the glass factory is on fire, Mm. he says there hasn't been a fire in 12 years. And then he gets up and he says, where's my shoes? There hasn't been a fire in 12 years. Where's my shoes? It's, I mean, it's hilarious at like a bottom level. And then I I feel like there's something behind that, that I'm just not clever enough to get the point of. Did you feel that way at all? Or Um, am I on an island there? (laughs) I don't know that I had the same response, but I I, I can completely see that in hindsight. Um, You've seen a handful of Herzog, right? Yes. Yeah. This is definitely putting me on the road to seeing most of Herzog. Yeah. After we do Nosferatu in October, I, I should be pretty damn close. Towards the top of his oeuvre for you? Uh, no. No. Um, a movie that a lot of people didn't like called Salt and Fire is actually like one of my favorites from him. I, I mm. think it could be my favorite. I'd, I'd have to look again, but I really responded well to that. I think it was uh, Jessica Chastain and Michael Shannon. Um, oh, yeah. Maybe Tracy Letts was in it briefly. Uh, Kyle... Garcia Bernal. God, how do you... What order does his names go in? I can't tell you. You know, oh, you know who I'm Gael talking Garcia about? Bernal. Yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah, what yeah, you yeah. said. That yeah, sounds okay. right. Um, he's got a brief run in there. Um, and then we have the physicist... Um, geez, I just lost his name. It, mm. There's like just a straight up physicist who's a great communicator of physics um, who plays a role like very much an Indiana Jones like evil villain role. Um, in the film, and it it tells it, it's straddling the line between documentary and drama um, about, I guess, climate change um, and how it's always existed and how it's different now and men's evilness and nature taking what it wants. Like it, it straddles all these lines. A lot of people didn't like it, but that's that's probably my favorite Herzog. Yeah, yeah. This was my very first Herzog. So no, yeah, absolutely. We're gonna hurts the fuck out of this show many to come uh and while i was maybe cool on it it definitely didn't uh close me off from him at all sometimes you see you know your first film by a director and you're like eh, this guy might not be for me this is Um, not representative of him as a director that's the sense i got you haven't Um, seen fitzcarraldo fitzcarraldo agira grizzly bear nothing um big blind spot you're gonna love agir and fitzcarraldo guarantee it i will shake your hand right now i'll bet you four or higher on both hands have been shaken yeah and my sense of both of those is that there there is more energy to those so i think just my familiarity with those even though i haven't seen them maybe set my expectations a little bit for this which ah, seemed like it's yes. completely a dumb thing so um it might just have been an expectation you might issue. want to start with him as a documentarian next to like uh there's a i think it's still on netflix lo and behold reveries of the interconnected world be a good spot for you or anyone else who's new to herzog to because he's it's it's like a director involved with the material type Mm. of a documentary so you get to know him and what's happening with the camera yeah yeah approachable there is no shortage of ones to choose from he's a busy man that is uh herzog's gloss um, Heart of Glass for those English speakers, which are most of the show. Um, I hope because we speak common tongue. <laughs> uh, what do you want to do next? I picked Heart of Glass. Would you like to go to Uncle Boon Me or Sunset? You pick. Let's just go in as hard as we can. Let's do Uncle Boon Me who can recall his past lives. All right. And see if I can recall anything.
This is a 2010 film from Thai filmmaker of Pichapong, We Receptacle. My Say understanding five times fast. cannot do it. According to Criterion, he just goes by Joe. So we can call him Joe for the All sake right. of this discussion. Well, he's a friend of the show, Joe. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> sure makes it sound like we're on good terms. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're flip-flopping here from Heart of Glass. Another quite slow movie, but one that I was quite high on. Extremely slow. I, I still... I, I think that with Heart of Glass, I eventually got to the right place in my head to watch it. Don't know that I did that with this one. Um, I'm pretty confident I didn't get to the right space. And I don't know if I can with something like this. Mm. This is kind of like when we were talking about the Chinese films earlier in mm. the year. And I just, I didn't ever arrive at that place where I felt like I was participating, particularly the one where I had no idea that it was shot like 20 years apart. It's still oh, like, yeah. uh, Ashes Purest White. Yeah. I, I still don't know that I can ever arrive. Yeah, I don't, there's something about that film that I don't feel like I can get on the wavelength of. Mm. And I, I struggle to admit that I think that might be true of this, even though there are mm. moments that I really love. And I'm still not sure if the whole thing was just um, him telling a story around the table at dinner time and that they're still there eating dinner. Mm. Yeah. Which is something I like about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did really respond to it. Uh, I found it incredibly tranquil and, uh, just calming and peaceful, um, which I think is especially interesting because it's essentially a ghost story. That's how I would think of it. Um. Did not figure that out until, like, the end. Till the end? Yeah. But there's, there's, like, ghosts. They, they, they appear. I thought they were real people and that it was, like, surrealism oh. and I did, was like, I don't get it. Oh, well, yeah, I, I do think it is rather surreal, since they do materialize in front of your eyes. Yeah, um, yeah I thought it was, like, kind of, like, Thailand big fishing me, where it was, like, hmm. he's telling a story, and then, like, someone appears, and you don't know if they're actually, like, part of the story, or, like, a real character, or, like, both, or something. Hmm. Y- you've seen Big Fish? You yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I thought maybe something in that realm was happening. Ah, um... Yeah, I would think that along with 24 Frames, this is one that I think sits pretty squarely in the realm of slow cinema. Um, even Heart of Glass is slow, but I don't think it has those same kind of long takes of just the really mundane, kind of deliberately boring stuff yeah. that's supposed to give you just kind of that that room to, to do whatever it is you need to do to, to find something in it. Um, and for me, it is sort of it being deliberately dull at times that makes it sort of uh, a spiritual kind of experience. There just has to be that kind of room for you to to move around in it. Um, and it's kind of this um, c- collapsing of the distinction between the ordinary and the otherworldly that I find really interesting. It's, you know, these scenes of long takes where something really mundane is happening, like people just sitting around a table having dinner. And suddenly a ghost, a spirit starts to materialize. But the scene hasn't really changed, right? There's no change of the camera angle. The editing welcomes the spirit of the ghost. The camera welcomes the spirit of the ghost. Um, So so the first guy that arrives at the dinner scene. The ghost? See, I was like, okay, we're in the supernatural and this is like Thailand Bigfoot. Okay. Or like Thailand Bigfoot werewolf. Like, oh, I, oh! You mean I, the the monkey? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha, like, gotcha. I had no i like I had no idea that it was ghosts until the end. Ah, uh, well, yeah. I guess I don't. I, I don't know that I would really. Did, what did I call the monkey a ghost? Beforehand? Um, or or did you just realize it while watching who was a ghost and who wasn't? I guess I didn't really think of the monkey as a ghost. Maybe just a a spirit of a kind. But when That's when the woman yeah. materializes, I most definitely thought of her as a as a spirit, as a specter, as a as a ghost of his as a ghost of his wife. And I was like, oh I missed that she was like in the other room making dinner. Really? Yeah. Like I, I just No, that's why they're all like surprised. <laughs> yeah, I just something about it. I just didn't get on that wavelength. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah, I don't know. Something about how the 
the staging of the scene does not change. You know, there it's slow, it's unsensational, and yet this is something completely out of the completely out of ordinary existence, obviously, and yet it is treated somewhat ordinarily, um, which uh, is just uh, not how. Um, Obviously, that subject matter is ordinarily treated in cinema. That you know, that's obvious. But um, yeah, it's deeply foreign. Yeah, and I, I think that's um, what makes it uh, more sp- spiritual in uh, in its nature. I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it needs to be boring. I think it needs to be dull for it to to kind of have that effect. You have to kind of gradually be getting on its wavelength and it's only kind of over time i think like it being slow is part of what makes it about the passage of time in a way and how past and present are kind of greeting each other in this right like these lives are kind of overlapping you're seeing ghosts of the past meet people in the present Hmm. um that that makes it a more makes it kind of a, a reflection on the passage of time um that only works if you if you if you do that yeah, yeah, I think that when I finished it, what spoke to me most is that it's it's not quite a fable, but it has fable parts. Mm-hmm. And like, if I had to sum it up, it's it's a film about eternalism, um, like just the perpetual nature of time, and that there's life, and that there's death, and that life is really no different than death. And I think that um, it really cements that best when he's dying in the cave. And she uh, she undoes the bandage for his catheter, and the the boy looks down at the urine leaking towards his shoe, and he he moves it and yeah. kind of retracts it, disgusted, and uh, just that you know in that scene there's there's two caretakers who are holding his hands and loving him while he's dying, and they they love him so much that they're relieving his bladder, and then there's this boy who's looking at what he could become disgusted by it at some level Mm. but still present for it and i think there's something deeply true about the nature of of living humanity yeah um, yeah at at work in that cave yeah yeah it could be like too sort of like ephemeral if you didn't have a sort of like just the bodily realities of death like this guy's body is dying Mm -hmm. um i yeah i think that is important otherwise it would be like a little too uh fluffy somehow um a little less in like tangible um but that feels like very grounded in reality only then to have something very um otherworldly enter those scenes without any shift in tone or staging um that's just a kind of an overlapping of like planes of existence in a way which sounds silly but that I just don't think you get in a lot of movies. No, that that's totally true. Um, there's a there's that documentary we watched last year on Netflix um, from the movie that didn't get made that was shot that was never released because the soundtrack and the film disappeared. What what's that called? The Singapore film. You know what oh, I'm talking about? Shirkers. Yes, this the tone really reminded me of Shirkers. Did, mm. did you feel that at all? Like cinema, the cinematography and kind of like it, it just felt like there was this uncanny theme of the lens that, that was kind of similar to what we saw in Shirkers, kind of the way that they'd shoot a room. I do re- remember how the bad guy, if you will, in that who actually took the movie was somehow kind of portrayed as this ghostly figure because he kind of mysteriously disappeared. Um so I think I can I can maybe see no 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 see that. I mean the cinematography of the lost film that we see those moments oh 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 um kind of I mean to me that was a little quirky yeah um I wouldn't have described this as quirky no but there's there's like a just something offbeat about it you know mm. like it's just it's off playing beat, in that's the for sure beat. um the cinematography because like it's be- this movie is beautifully framed but there's something just um. It's not eccentric, but it's close. Mm. There's something about this movie that's near eccentric, but it's so lovingly made that, that it doesn't quite ring as 
eccentric as much as sincere, but there's it just felt like there was that um, sentimentality bleeding through to me from yeah. some of those original film shots and shirkers to this. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Um, one movie that was coming to mind for me was uh, David Lowry's A Ghost Story, partly because I remember him on his press tour for that constantly talking about how influenced he was by the slow cinema of directors like We Were Set the Cole and Ho Chao Shen and how that really inspired the pie eating scene, right? Mm. Which is like, the I don't know, five to ten minutes. Scene at the moment. Exactly. Um, and how that movie is all about, you know, a ghost being tethered to a particular place, to a house mm. being uh, his, his haunting of a particular uh, house. And this... Um, there's a line in Uncle Boon Me that says something um, about, I think it's maybe one of the ghosts, it says, uh, ghosts don't haunt places, they haunt people, or mm-hmm. they, they're attached to people. Yes. Um, so they're, I just, I found that like interesting. In a timeline. Yeah, yeah. That uh, I think a ghost story does ponder the passage of time in a similar way, with that ghost being stuck to this house across, uh, you know, the, the infinite. Um, versus this in which um the ghosts are attached to the people um just kind of an interesting um direction he he took this in since this was um a, a point of influence for him yeah i i mean it's definitely ghosts are attached to people but i think that what what leads is the importance of like sentimental or emotions and in how emotions beget feelings um that that kind of never leave you Mm. um and that that might be what ghosts are um, Mm. at some level i i think that that was kind of a subtext that i picked up on once i picked up that those characters were ghosts i was like okay well what was the common theme of all those ghosts it was the emotional attachment that these people had to them Mm. yeah yeah i mean i think i would definitely get that out of the scene where one of the ghosts is just hugging the Uncle Boon me for mm-hmm. an extended period of time. Yes. Um, certainly one of the more emotional shots. Um, I would completely agree. Was it, you said in your review that you weren't sure what to make of the, like, some of the photography sequences, right? Didn't you say something along the lines of that first kind of bit where one of the guys is reflecting on his photography practice, right? Maybe you were referring to something else. I I don't. Um, I mean I'm I'm confused about the the statement that he's make that Joe is making about visual media and visual mm. mediums. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay. I don't remember what I said about photography. I I do remember um, that I'm kind of I'm at a loss for complete understanding. I just know that something's there um regarding visual media and how the young boy is always staring at the tv and so is the the woman with one leg shorter than the other they're just always looking at the tv watching the tv and i think that whatever he's getting at it is is um better understood by his mosquito net metaphor um you know he's he's using that deeper than just a functional utilitarianism in the film of like this is the region there's mosquitoes there's something being communicated about that mosquito net and how how we see them get under it and then we are with the camera inside the mosquito net looking out and sometimes looking in on them through that that veil and there's something about the veil of the world and um that i think that's communicated through the photography um in the film um that's referenced through the television watching and through that mosquito net like there's something about the veils of reality that he's getting at that i haven't totally stitched together yeah yeah it does certainly uh create a visual layer that seems to speak to the uh layers of reality uh, that are kind of uh on top of each other in the movie um much of which like i don't know that like i know how to speak to in any particular sense it's more about like the general kind of vibe of the thing that i just kind of uh kind of fell into 
Yeah, um, you can like feel something's there, but you don't know it. Yeah, yeah, it's more just kind of about the mood and just just slipping into it um, than it is about like getting too hung up about like any particular sequence. Um, even though there can be plenty of striking images, um, but uh, favorite scene. Good question. I would probably say when uh, the ghost of his wife first materializes. Um, that was certainly when I was most taken aback. Maybe it's just because it's the first time it happens. But um, just kind of how unsensational it was um, struck me as uh, special, I suppose. What about you? Oh, you know. Catfish sexy time. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what to make of it. Um, uh, it, well, it's, it's a fable, right? It's, it's the, um, making a deal with nature and, um, you know, something there, there's, you know, it's, it's like an old myth idea of a God being in an animal and then breeding with a human woman. And then whatever they bear is something, you know, not quite human, not quite God that, that, you know, is deeper. And I think that, um. Yeah, it's it's getting at that age old myth, and it, it doesn't really make a clear statement about what, but it's using that motif. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole kind of premise is, you know, takes reincarnation as as a thing, um, which so makes you could, every you could argue that Liberté is influenced by Uncle Boomy. <laughs> How so? Uh, well, he's breeding with an animal. See? Oh, whoa. <laughs> Deep connections here. Uh, but once you kind of like accept that reincarnation is a part of this movie, it kind of changes every interaction with an insect or animal, right? Yeah. She's walking around the house squishing bugs. They start talking about karma, right? And how you squish a bug, you don't know just who you might be squishing and what you might come back as. Um and yeah, those those really banal scenes maybe then take on a little bit more significance. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is the second movie of his I've seen, and the last one I just found uh, left me completely cold. Like I didn't go for it at all. So I have clearly changed in my movie going. That was a long time ago, um, but uh, I have come around for sure. What's his most recent film? I think. It was the last one I saw, which was Cemetery of Splendor, which came out in 2016, okay. I believe. So we're due for a new release from him anytime. Yeah, yeah. He's been doing uh, stuff on the festival circuit, um, a project called, I think it's called Sleep Cinema Hotel, which is some that. kind of yeah video installation project where he's more than okay with people going to sleep during his projects. Um, so okay. you can stay the night, like during the festival at the Sleep Cinema Hotel. Okay. Um, sounds awesome i think we should plan to go to that hotel <laughs> i agree where do we make our reservation uh, we'll let you know um on to the final uh entry and the the sunset of our show the film sunset Miért jött ide? Ez a szüleim üzlete. Az volt. You and I are unanimously the most positive on this one out of the entries this week. We're both kind of on the same wave, same wavelength, not the same wavelength. <laughs> I think that's right. This film has had kind of an interesting life. I would hmm. say his last film, Son of Saul, won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film, critically acclaimed generally speaking i think this is pretty much fl flown under the radar yes didn't Agreed. get much of a theatrical release it did did not get a wide release at all as far as i know i think it played you know in new york and la yeah but otherwise has come and gone without much fanfare um actually i shouldn't say it's gone because we're talking about it today yeah but it's there's something weird yeah it's it's odd that this did not receive um, 
or the, it was not received really yeah. in any capacity other than you know film historians and archivists um and major the two major cities that have archivists and historians that are employed yeah yeah i think it played venice this time last year i think it played the new york film festival um i got the sense that there were champions of it but it just didn't catch on i don't know what happened exactly um but maybe we'll get into that i really enjoyed this film what about you agreed in retrospect i like it more than i liked it while i was watching it it's like after i watch the shot i can appreciate the shot more than when i'm watching it because it is shot kind of third person present tense so you don't really get to remove yourself from the film you kind of I felt that I was at some level Iris the way that when I'm reading a book third person present like I feel like I am that character or like I'm suspending the disbelief into pretending that I'm either accompanying that character hiding in the bushes or that I'm overtly them or with them Mm, yeah yeah uh yeah it struck me as incredibly immersive um I I 100% felt like I was in this movie often lost i completely own that it that is maybe just me that i just lost hold of this plot after a certain point um and yet that didn't really hold me back from just being thrilled by the craft of it um i i definitely responded to it most like on a uh formal level i suppose um yeah to put it simply like i did find it hard to follow but i i don't disagree with that. I think that's definitely on purpose. And from what I heard him make comments about it's when he makes a historical film, he wants to try to not pretend that reality is different than it is. Like he, he said that he takes a lot of problems with like how the camera's always in the right spot at the right time for the right event in most historical film. And that when he was making this film it it's not like her life has a, a narrative purpose it's not following a plot she just randomly is in the middle of these sequences where she's reacting and we're there with her as a witness and what happens happens and there's you know it's not overtly one plus one is two two plus one is three type of plotting from him and he said that that's something he strives for and hate not hates, but dislikes about mm. most historical cinema. So I think yeah. that, that he would agree with you. And uh, once I heard him put it like that, it kind of, uh, it makes more sense in retrospect. Yeah. Yeah. I maybe wish that it had just been like even more, I, this is the same thing I said earlier about a different movie now, but I wish it had maybe then been just even more, vague in a certain way because it kind of kept feeling to me like I was supposed to have a better sense of what was going on than I did um mm. you know it That's didn't it, like it. it feels very grounded in reality like things are are kind of supposed to be adding adding up and they're and they're not for me like it just felt like maybe it was just need, needlessly difficult to follow I, I, I mm. couldn't really decide um because she doesn't usually seem lost in the chaos of this to me she usually seems to kind of you know she's discovering things but she doesn't seem confused i guess which is which is partly how i felt um i i was kind of interpreting it as she's like she's trying not to let herself um into that space where she has to be honest about like how lost she is Mm. like she just like kept fighting kept swimming up the river if you will mm. against the everyone's wishes constantly doing arguably the wrong thing based on what everyone tells her and perhaps based on what's best for her and what's best to limit her from committing murder but also the consequences of what she does saves a girl so it's it's hard you know it it seems honestly like he said kind of like history where you're not really on the right side there is no right side mm. when you're in the middle of it and yeah you don't really know what's actually happening <laughs> partly the movement of the camera suggests that you're just kind of in the tide of history you're just he, along the, do, yeah. do you know this he he wanted to shoot it handheld or not handheld he wanted to shoot it solid and then when he found out he couldn't shoot it solid he wanted to shoot it on a dolly mm. and then um just the consequences of the project 
forced him to go 35 millimeter handheld, mm. which is something he did not want to do. I think it looks great. I do too. I think it's amazing that it looks awesome and that it's the last thing you wanted to do. Yeah, it clearly worked out uh, from a visual standpoint. Um, whenever I see a movie like this, I think of Emmanuel Lebetsky, right, who's kind of infamous for that really fluid kind of constantly moving camera but there's always like a polish to that to me yeah. that reminds me like just how kind of technically virtuosic it is which Almost sometimes the quality to it so, yeah sometimes it feels just a little too slick for me whereas this kind of has a rough and tumble quality to it um that uh is even more immersive in a way don't get me wrong i do like lubeski at times but this has just that extra kind of Grunge. immediacy to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Do you know who, who or what other film this cinematographer shot besides Son of Saul? No, I don't. James White. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Interesting. Gosh, it's been so long since I saw that. Um, I'll have to go I back can, and like, watch some clips. like, feel it. Like, thinking about the darkness and the shadows and how it follows Christopher Abbott around in that apartment. Oh, yeah. Like, I remember, dialogue, yeah. interactions with the mom and... Yeah, there's, I think, the opening long take where you start out in a club, right? Yeah. And you you think it's the middle of the night and the camera follows them all the way out into the street and it's like 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, so, yeah, he, he's clearly uh, a capable camera operator. Yes. Um, which is pretty great. Uh, yeah, I mean, even though I sometimes felt lost, it just didn't really hold me back from being really kind of thrilled by it well i think i think that she's lost and i i liked being lost with her is what i would say like i i enjoyed that storytelling motif i suppose of you know we're both two fish out of the water and we're in the middle of budapest trying to figure out what the fuck is happening and why and what women are getting kidnapped and murdered and raped and Dude, like, who's this person that's holding me down trying to rape me? Now there's a group of people holding me down trying to rape me. Now I'm being accused of wanting to be raped for leaving my lamp on and falling asleep. Like, what the fuck is happening to me? And then, like, the the uh, the reversal where fireworks are, like, a nightmarish quality in mm. this film is is just a fascinating reversal. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I responded really well to all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's certainly how I... Ooh, that's certainly what I want to lean into. It's maybe partly how she is playing it too. I really do like her, but there is a, you know, that, that very consistent look of kind of grim determination that looks to me like she does kind of know what she's seeking. Um, she, she does seem to know what she's looking for. And sometimes that determination may be kind of conflicted with that sense of disorientation that I was feeling. Um, yeah, there's something there. Yeah, you're right. There is something there because, like, I did not realize she was capable of murder. Mm. She and, is, and like <laughs> once once that happened, I kind of like didn't know what to do about the movie. Like, I didn't know what the movie was. Uh, I, I still don't. I just know that I, I like that. I, I like it. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. But I can still kind of just appreciate it in a, like in a broader sense of it just being about, you know, the the the, the moment before darkness falls, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the title kind of suggests that in the first place. Um, and it does feel like the movie is just hurtling towards um, something worse all the time um, and that it's set right before a world war. Um it just, that kind of speaks for itself, I guess. Um, yeah, the journey from one city to the other, looking for meaning and getting confronted with death. And uh, what's that opening line? Um, Let's lift the veil on this one mm. or something. And I, I was like, okay, let's mm. do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, it just looks, I think it just looks so good. So much of the, the costume design. And production design, it just, you know, they're... No they're, CG. I think you're right. No, 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 I know I'm right. He did an interview. No CG. Mm. Blows my mind. It's pretty great. To me, I can just feel like I can divide period details 
deep period movies between those that have a sense of it being lived in and those that don't other ones there are like costume dramas and then there are the ones that just feel lived like in. this that feel like yeah yeah, I'd say this and Peter Lou are in a league of their own this year. Yeah. But I, I responded better to this than Peter Lou. It's like the Kira Knightley ones fall always in the other category. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Is Colette this year? I think that was last year. Thank God. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> we end up talking about Kira Knightley a lot. We do. She's a good actress. Just she is. Bad projects. Um, Could she have pulled this off? No. I don't think so either. No, no, not at all. Not I at agree. all. Julie <laughs> That is, was not really a, a real question. Is an interesting actress. She's not been in very many pictures, but there's there's something um special about her that I uh, gosh, I'm forgetting her name now that I, I saw kind of the same magnetism in the gal from Cold War. Hmm. Kulig? Yeah, Joanna Kulig. Mm. Um did you have a favorite scene in this film? Oh, man. I don't know. Because it kind of just felt like the whole thing is... It, it has that feeling that it's all one shot in a way. Because it, there are so many the long ends. takes. Um, gosh, I don't know. I usually was happiest when we were in the hat shop, actually. Um, I don't know why. I, I just so believed that place as, as yeah. a real place. Oh, yeah. You? Uh, I, I think it's, it's a, a cheap answer, but I feel like the beginning and the end shot are the same shot hmm. at some level. And I, I think that the way that she looks up at the end when she's in the, uh, the trenches as a nurse looking at these men that are covering themselves in the trench walls and the trench roofing from the rain in the middle of the, the maelstrom of World War One, against the beginning where she lifts the veil on the hat and the camera zooms out and does a reverse shot of her in the hat with it lifted. There's something joining those. And I feel like they're, mm. that's how I understand the film. And I, yeah. I love that. I love yeah, that. yeah. To me, the veil coming up at the end is almost like a fake out because to me, it feels like this whole thing is through a veil. It is a little a little fuzzy. Um, but it's a great opening shot. <laughs> Anything else? Or are we done? Highly recommended. Oh, yeah. Uh, why do you think this, uh, didn't catch on? Any, any thoughts? I, I, I have no idea. Cause we watched that stupid, uh, Maybe it's not stupid. I did not like it. We watched the foreign film at Cinerama early this year that was nominated for an Oscar uh, about the kids. It's that Middle Eastern movie. You know what I'm talking about? Gabby gave it like a five. Oh, Capernaum. Capernaum. So if Capernaum can catch on and this can't, I don't, I don't know. I have no idea makes no sense because cold war had a bunch of praise and i don't see how this is that different than cold war um subtextually Mm. and i think that the the lighting the camera work the costumes the performances the direction the fact that he'd won an oscar like how is this not exactly what they want yeah my only thought was that after son of saul people might have thought of thought he would do something equally so-called capital I important, right? That is, you know, a reality that is horrifying that people, you know, think needs to be remembered and that kind of thing. Um, and this one you could maybe just describe as more of a thriller in a way, right? Like, I don't think this is as, um, it's not as directly connected to something, you know, so ingrained in our, like, greater consciousness, you know? Yeah, that's um, true. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill tastemakers political or social agendas in any way right right um which you know i just think that's an unfair burden to put on a filmmaker yeah yeah but. especially because he he resented that that's in the interview i listened to he resented that that's how he was portrayed and 
he was offered like a lot of historical period piece films that were capital I important and he refused mm-hmm. all of them and made this instead. Yeah. So um, I think that speaks to an auteur that I'm happy to follow the rest of his days. Word. Um, I guess that's it for this one. I think that's it. See you next time, folks. And as Michael always says, that's another one in the can. Run! Go! Get to the chopper! We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant.